Winds of War, 384YE Spring Equinox. Overview. Over the last three months, Imperial forces are engaged in military campaigns against barbarian forces. Sometimes those engagements have been wide-ranging and dramatic, and at other times they've been more sedate. This season, we're trying something a little different with the Winds of War. While the overarching details of the campaign are summarised here, some of the Winds of War, where there's been more dramatic action or where there's a battle opportunity, have been given their own pages. We've also worked to try and provide even more detail about the battle opportunities for the event than ever. After the event, we'd be interested in hearing your feedback about how these changes affected the game in the field at the usual address, which is Matt at profounddecisions.co.uk. As always, how much or little of this information you choose to know in character is up to you. Part of the purpose of the Winds of War and the Winds of Fortune is to maintain the illusion of the Empire as a living, breathing place where things happen, and to make players aware of the things their characters should know based on what the role-playing says they've been doing for the past three months. Also, it should go without saying that we ask everyone to abide by the rules about online role-playing with regard to the military campaign. It's important that the key in-character activity of the Empire world takes place at events. The game is busier and better if everything that can happen in the field does happen in the field. Military planning and political discussions should happen at events. For this reason, we generally discourage too much downtime role-playing between events and put strict limits on what can be done online, particularly using our forums and Facebook groups. With that in mind, we now present a summary of the key military activity in the Empire, both with links to the expanded Wind of War pages and notes about the other important things that have happened that didn't need a full battle campaign. In the West. In the Southwest, the Lasambrian Yatun withdraw entirely from Segura, allowing Imperial armies to liberate the town of Andus and remove all trace of the Orc invaders. Almost immediately after leaving one freeborn territory, however, they launch a probing raid into another. The Lasambrian Yotun launch an assault into Karaman, focusing their attention on securing the southern region of Gambit. You can learn more about the campaign in the Brass Coast in the Wind of War all the way. Further north, in Bregasland, both the Yotun and Imperial armies are on the defensive. A quiet trickle of support from disgruntled Bregas slowly swells the warband of Matilda Fisher, but no territory changes hands. You can read more about the quiet season in Bregasland in The Wind of War, The False Kings. Not all the marches are equally quiet, however. With the tusks billeted and upwalled, the Bounders take surprising action in the Mornwald. Under the orders of their general, they form a ring of steel around Whittle, allowing nobody to leave, allowing nobody to enter who is not themselves a marcher. There is reportedly significant anger from the magistrates who need to enter Whittle to prosecute those folk named as blasphemers and heretics for their role in the sect of hatred that festers there. Bounders are implacable. Only marcher magistrates and militia will be allowed into the town. You can read more about this situation in The Winds of Fortune. There have been disturbing developments in the far north as well. Immediately after the winter solstice, news quickly spreads that the Yotun have successfully completed their mission in Skarsind. Isa Winterborn and her allies collapse the western end of Parkinan's Pass, blocking movement between the East Flows and Skarsind until the Empire is able to clear the path again. The only way to move between Semesuak and the Orc Island is through the northern passes controlled by the Thule. Even though the Orcs of Okadov are allied with the Empire in their fight against the Yotun, they've made no indication that Imperial troops are free to freely move between the Silver Peaks and Crow's Ridge. While the pass is still open between Harmark and Skarsind, the destruction has been extensive. The clattering gully is no more, and the Krampus Hall has likewise been destroyed. These Jatun forces responsible for this destruction withdraw into Semesuak. There, they encounter Imperial armies and their Thul allies, already taking the fight to the Jotun conquerors of the Suak homeland. The joint forces of the Empire and Okdov free East Flows and send battle raging across the tundra of the Suak font. As the Spring Equinox draws clear, the Empire and their allies have pushed the barbarians west. 
into the well-defended regions on the edge of the Yotun nation. You can read details of the Surma Suak campaign in The Wind of War, given and denied. In the east, skip across the empire from Surma Suak and Skarsind, across the great breadth of Varushka to the edge of the Malum, to the forest of Ulmak in the far northeast. Dornish and Varushkan armies that had probed the defences of the Druze in the months following the autumn equinox have unexpectedly withdrawn, leaving only a few outposts behind. A month after the winter solstice, all of those outposts fall silent almost simultaneously. There are very few concrete details, but final scattered reports from the south suggest a major force of Druze swept into Alnak from the south and quickly reclaimed the small amount of territory conquered by the empire. There's no longer an imperial presence in the forest of Alnak. Then fly south along the borders of Dawn over the twisted madness at the heart of Brokeliand, past Navarre and highborn hearths between the skyscraping peaks of Morrow to the final theatre of war. Imperial forces have again engaged the Druge in Zenith. Last season, despite great courage, the Imperial forces were driven back. This season, however, the campaign falls in the Empire's favour. Imperial armies are roughly halfway towards securing a beachhead in Clippian. The Citadel Guard have secured a particular advantage, unleashing a powerful, ensnaring work of autumn magic against the Druze armies there, leaving them restricted in how far they can move in the coming campaign season. All has not gone entirely in the Empire's favour, however. There have been encounters with former Imperials transformed into unliving slaves of the Druze and powered by unquenchable hate to hunt and kill their former siblings. These tormented souls are set by the Druze to terrorise the Imperials in Zenith, further complicating the liberation beyond the problems already presented by the Druze miasma. It's also clear that the Druze are trying some terrible, magical working of their own in the ruined marshes of Proceris, with the aid of sinister Gulai from the swamps of the Sarangrave, that might shift the situation even more in their favour. You can read the details of the Zenith campaign and the twin opportunities to take battle to the Druze in The Wind of War, The Carnival of Rust. Battle opportunities. Imperial prognosticators have identified four possible major conjunctions of the Sentinel Gate at the coming summit. The Friday night muster will see the generals debate these options, and then select two of them to be taken up by Imperial heroes eager to influence the direction of the Empire's military campaigns. Two battle opportunities are only available on Saturday against the Jotun Yagara, and two are available on Sunday against the Druze. The first opportunity is Samasuak, channel a Thule ritual magic to destroy a fortification and perhaps reduce the aid of Kath and Kene for the Yotun. The opposition is the Yotun Yagara, it's Saturday only. Your second opportunity would be in Karaman, which is to intercept a Yagara force moving to conquer the town of Riata and secure a beachhead in Gambit. Your opposition for that is the Yotun Yagara and that's also Saturday only. Your third opportunity is Zenith, and with the aid of Zakalwe, destroy the Miasma Pillars, and perhaps reduce the terror caused by tormented spirits in the territory. Your opposition would be the Druze Orcs, and that's Sunday only. And finally, your last opportunity is also in Zenith, but to intercept the Gulai, bringing vital resources to the tainted basilisk ritualists in Proceris. Again, this is the Druze Orcs, and again, it's Sunday only. There will also be skirmishes throughout the weekend that allow Imperial heroes to engage the barbarian enemies of the Empire. These will be covered in more detail in the Winds of Fortune. Yagara Battles Two of the battle opportunities listed involve Yotun Yagara as the main opponents. Whichever opportunity the Military Council decides on for Saturday, will be asking the majority of player volunteers to take on the roles of human warriors fighting for the Yotun. In the Karaman battle, the Empire will be facing human warriors formerly of Mornwald in the marches. You can make this battle even better by bringing along any marcher or wintermark style kit or armour that you have, as well as any iconic marcher weaponry, particularly bill, spears or pole arms, along with any appropriate shield or buckler. This can help us make a dramatic battle opportunity where the Empire must face down a predominantly human opponent. You can read more about iconic marcher looks on the wiki. 
In the Summer Suak battle, you can help by bringing along any Yotun style kit or armor that you have, as well as any iconic Yotun weaponry, particularly axes, maces, and circular shields. And javelins are ideal if you have them. You can find out more about the iconic Yotun look again on the wiki. We understand the difficulty of getting to an event with additional kit at the best of times, especially as it's not going to be possible to tell before Friday night whether the military council will elect to take this battle. But if you are able to bring such kit along, it will improve the experience, as well as that of the players that you're fighting against. If you're already part of an elite monster unit that can outfit for a Yatoon warband and you have your own personal orc mask, then please come to battle prep as you normally would for these battles. If you're part of such a unit but you don't have your own orc mask, then you can either monster as a non-fighting thrall alongside the unit or join one of the other Yagara units. We will not be running mixed units of human and orc warriors for this battle. And very importantly, we will not be issuing any orc masks to players for these battle opportunities. Our orc masks will only be used once this event and then washed ready for the next event. We are continuing the provision of battle opportunities with non-orc enemies as a part of our plan to reduce the coronavirus risks until such a time as we have sufficient masks to run two fully orc masked battles. And for further reading or listening, you can listen to False Kings, which is the Bregaslan campaign. You can listen to All the Way, which is the Segura and Karaman campaign. There's Given and Denied, which is the Summer Suat campaign, and the Carnival of Rust, the Zenith campaign. And look out for more information in the 384YE Spring Equinox, Winds of Fortune.